4.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, breathing new life to old structures, Beijing's ancient neighborhoods get a makeover, crumbling monuments, the challenges in saving and preserving some of the most prized relics of Pakistan's past. And back to the basics. How some Nepalese are rebuilding houses destroyed by an earthquake using native materials. I'm Wang Mengmang, and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the show. As the world changes fast, preserving what remains of the past is a huge undertaking. Here in Beijing, one of the enduring features of ancient life is the hutong. But many communities like this are experiencing wear and tear. That's why some people have taken on the task of renovating houses in Beijing's hutong neighborhoods. I spoke with them about the challenges they face, like convincing residents to embrace change. Sixty-two-year-old Dong Xuemei has lived in a hutong all her life. Her family's house is small and dilapidated, but they're used to this way of living. A distinctive feature of ancient Beijing, hutong is a Mongolian word meaning water well. Hutongs, or alleys, lined by courtyard houses, were first constructed during the Yuan Dynasty in the 13th to 14th centuries. Back then, people built their homes around water wells as a living necessity. For hundreds of years, these neighborhoods stood the test of time, reflecting their deep cultural legacy. But with Beijing's rapid urbanization, ancient hutongs now face a wealth of challenges. Crumbling rooftops, cracked walls, and broken windows. Renovating is a challenge, especially if it involves old historical houses. But this man offers a solution. James Chen is a Chinese American born and raised in California. He and his partners are trying to help local <coughs> residents live in a modern way while keeping the old houses fully intact in Dashilar, one of the oldest hutongs in Beijing. This entire courtyard, different space, different functions. Well, uh, this side will be offices, and over here will be uh, an ex exhibition space. Um, we'll be showing uh, information on our plug-in system, so we'll be explaining this whole project. And then uh, next to this is a space of um, one of the local residences. Oh, uh, individual. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's he grew up here, and uh, he's lived here for. Uh, I don't know, like 50 years, um, and he he wants to stay here, and we're we're happy with that. Uh, but we're especially excited that he's interested in uh, using the plug-in for his space. These are not people with a lot of money, so uh, and I think they're very careful with anything that they do. So the fact that they're willing to take part of this pilot, I think, is a is a very positive thing. The plug-in is a prefabricated panel made of a composite that incorporates structure, insulation, wiring, plumbing, windows, doors, interior, and exterior finishes into one model part. The panels are light, easy to handle, and cheap to ship. They snap and lock together with the use of a single tool, a hex wrench. The entire structure can be assembled by a few people in one day and requires no skill or special training. The reason why we've approached it this way, um, not tearing anything down, is also because we, we value a lot of this history. Even when things don't look so elegant or so perfect, uh, in fact, there's, there's a lot of uh, important traces of history there. I think the most important thing is the people in these areas, uh, they, they're the ones that make these environments uh, attractive. Uh, it's, you know, you could have really nice looking buildings, but if you don't have the kind of life that you have in the hutongs, then it's sort of pointless. 
So the people, you know, selling things on the streets or the kids playing around, all that kind of stuff. Liang Ying works for a company that invites designers and students to put their skills to good use in renovating hutongs. This part of project provides a temporary solution that has the potential to become a long-term one, but getting everyone on board isn't that easy. Many people we spoke to who have lived here for generations are more reluctant to change. They say everything is fine the way it is. We've squished our original uh, wall thickness down to 50 millimeters now, so it's very, very thin. Uh, you would probably not see that really anywhere, uh, but it functions just as well as a wall that's you know five times its its thickness. We've worked very hard to try to find ways of getting people to um, come on board and say, okay, yes, you know, this 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 does make my space much better than than before. 大概需要一两天就能安装好了，而且成本比较节省。用这个方法呢，我们就可以在不那个影响居民的情况下，呃，把这个房屋等于是充分的利用起来。But it's not all perfect. James says they're working to make the project more efficient and are trying to provide more design choices for different types of courtyards. All kind of moving into this area. The Dashlar project uh, and us together, we we're interested in having this be something that is really mass produced in large quantities. Uh, we've developed an online uh, system where you can design your own space, uh, you can add a toilet, add a kitchen, you see how the space would be organized. Uh, you can also calculate how much it would cost, how much energy you'll be saving. James also admits that Hutong residents need more time to fully embrace his group's ideas. So what brought you here, James? Like, what's your personal interest in this project? Well, our office is actually also in a courtyard house. Uh, it's next to the Forbidden City, so a bit north of here. Um, originally, people thought it was really strange that a design office would want to be in a courtyard house in, in a residential area. But for us, this is where we get a lot of our inspirations from, uh, just kind of from the everyday life and how people uh, uh, solve, you know, their everyday problems. Uh, that actually helps us a lot with how we decide to uh, approach our designs. Liang Ying, who brought this project to Dashlar, believes it could inspire more ideas. Despite some residents' skepticism and resistance to change, people like James are determined to bring a new look and feel to Beijing's old neighborhoods while preserving their culture. The Courtyard House plug-in was recognized on the world stage in 2015, winning the new and old award at the World Architects Festival and the Architizer Award for living small and low-cost housing. Next, on Assignment Asia. The sorry state of some of Pakistan's historical structures and what authorities are doing about it. Pakistan has a colorful history of empires and conquests and their remnants are visible to this day. 
Unfortunately, after many years of neglect, a number of ancient buildings are in a state of disrepair. Daniel Khan visited some decaying ancient structures in the city of Lahore and looked into efforts by the government and experts to bring back their old glory. An ancient culture representing the majestic lives of kings and emperors still echoes through the city of Lahore. These buildings are a blend of centuries past from the Mughal dynasty to the Sikh empire to the era of the British Raj. A mixture of Victorian and Islamic architecture known as Indo-Gothic. But what stand out the most are the powerful remnants of the Mughal Empire. Since uh, you know the Mughal era, uh, the first and foremost uh, point that uh, was raised in that time was uh, to project uh, the Mughals as the ultimate rulers of that uh, era. But this statement, these symbols of power, are falling to decay. The rule of the Mughals began in 1526 and lasted more than 300 years. The emperors claimed direct descent from Genghis Khan and Temur. In the mid-16th century, influences arrived from Central and West Asia under Akbar the Great. The Mughals brought their Muslim culture and a unique architecture. Forts and palaces served as emblems of power and wealth. The Islamic architecture of the Mughals is drawn from secular and religious styles. Religion throughout history has greatly influenced the Muslim society, so much so that we find its imprint on art and architecture. And even Lahore, the great seat of learning, could not escape from the impact of religion. The structures that became symbols of Islamic architecture are the mosque, the tomb, the palace, and the fort. It was the mosques that really brought out the true magnificence of the Mughal Empire. As seen here with the Masjid Wazir Khan. But between the wars and sieges by the Sikhs in the 19th century and the British occupation, the monumental heritage of Lahore started to crumble. Uh, Daniel, this is an amazing wall and a unique piece of architecture where in tile mosaic where you find different scenes, for example, people playing polo and, you know, there's a different thing. It's like a miniature painting, series of miniature paintings on the wall. And started during Jahangir's time and uh, it was during Shah Jahan's time that it got finished. So one of the most precious walls of Mughal architecture and it's in sheer neglect. After the fall of the Mughal dynasty in the 19th century, these monuments were hit by apathy and remained that way for years. In 1927, the government devised a rehabilitation plan, but it took decades before preservation measures were introduced in 1975. 
including replacing or repairing damaged areas, raising public awareness about protecting the monuments and punishing anyone who defaces the antiquities. Yet, despite these measures, the buildings are crumbling and the valuable mosaic paintings are fading. There is some funding from the government, international donors and philanthropists. But without the right people to do it, restoration efforts are ineffective. They are not pe trained people around faulty conservation attempts, uh, over restoration is, the, is, the, is some, uh, some of the problems that we face here uh, in Pakistan. Sajad Kosar is a professor at a National University of Architecture. He's been working with historical buildings for the last 20 years. There are certain problems because, you know, there's a, uh, maybe uh, there are structural problems in the columns. And uh, if you move there, uh, they've introduced iron uh, strips around it uh, as, a, as a measure. You know, but, but what, the, what it is doing, it's rusted now. And so it is doing a damage because the rust is traveling in the marble. In Pakistan, the basic deficiency is education and conservation. We do not have any department at all of conservation. The, the multidisciplinary team which is needed to conserve uh, heritage doesn't exist. So there's a major dilemma. But it's not even an issue of formal education. There are fewer and fewer skilled artisans who can work with stone, which is required on these sites. And Ayaz, who has been working on preserving the monuments, says the practice is now on a decline. कारीगर तो बेशक इसमें बहुत ज़्यादा कम रह गए हैं, बहुत कम हो गए हैं कारीगर। समझ लें आटे में नमक के बराबर हैं। बस यही कोई हाथ शार्प पे पर डे पड़ जाता है कारीगर को, जिससे कि उसके रोज़ मरा रूटीन के ख़राब आदत भी नहीं पूरे हो पाते। इसलिए वो डिस्टर्ब भी रहता है। जब आदमी डिस्टर्ब with the lack of resources and people to do the work, the government's archaeology department can only attend to a few historical monuments and archaeological sites. We are not collecting enough material knowledge about the decay of buildings and what, can, what kind of material is used to stop the decay. Minimum intervention is always the best. If there's a crack here, just, just remove that crack, uh, stitch that crack, you know. Uh, and that's about all. You don't have to uh, build a new wall altogether. And to make matters worse, aspiring architects told me the government has a lot of red tape. So getting funding approved can be a long and difficult process. While everyone is quick to blame the government for the present condition of our historical site, it can't take all the blame. Experts believe the people are as responsible with their destructive behavior as the government is with its neglect. Around old monuments, people litter on the ground. Inside the old city, known as the walled city, where many Mughal structures reside, we found broken windows and doors with brilliant carvings thrown away on the roadside and evidence of couples carving their names into centuries-old mosaics. There should be a major restriction on the admission of uh, people and public, and uh, they should be trained before they enter, because these are uh, historical and uh, the, uh, monuments. In 2013, nearly $8 million were allocated to the walled city. Kamran Lashari, is the project's director. He has a lot of experience with similar projects around Pakistan, and he's painfully aware that things have to be done right. We pool 
the resource of the experts of the city, uh, wherever they are, in their private capacity or, or otherwise, and uh, only then, then touch a place. And uh, I'm very mindful of this, that uh, sometimes you can kill with your love. But like many countries in the developing world, the need to grow and modernize is encroaching on historical artifacts. The wall city is unfortunately turning from wall city to a warehouse. And uh, there's so much of commercial interest involved that people are demolishing their old houses and turning them into plazas and go downs and uh, stores and things like that. We can uh, generate so much revenue uh, through tourism if we invite uh, tourists. And uh, other than that, I think it's the social responsibility of all the young architects and all the practicing architects that before they start working, uh, they, they should just uh, voluntarily work towards the preservation of this architecture. Pakistan possesses a rich cultural heritage represented in the monuments and archaeological sites around the country. Even though some of their value is lost through a lack of conservation, there is a lot to save. For Assignment Asia, I'm Daniel Khan in Lahore, Pakistan. Pakistan's conservationists are struggling to revive what's left of the country's architectural treasures. They say any effort would be fruitful only if the public sees the importance of the monument and if the government takes stronger steps to protect them. Still to come, earthquake-proofing Nepal through native architecture. Tens of thousands died and lost their homes when an earthquake hit Nepal in April 2015. A daunting task of rebuilding followed. But one man and his firm are doing it differently. Instead of concrete, a Nepalese design and architecture company uses earth and bamboo to rebuild homes. And as Pearly Jacob tells us, it comes as the promise that the houses can withstand the strongest quakes. Like in itself, it's a beautiful experience. You know, like the whole land which looks so robust, so rigid, but it's kind of fluid and it's like moving. It felt like everything would collapse. It's what we build with, how we build it, that's what kills people. After the earthquake, one of the m major things been people don't know how to rebuild. They're totally confused. And we were very modest and very small. And then the earthquake happened, and all our buildings survived. You know, and and that has I think given us a validation, not just to us, to people that you can build with earthen material, natural material, which can survive like 7.8 earthquakes. My passion, my expertise is with earth. Uh, rammed earth we are very comfortable with because we can do it really fast. It looks really beautiful. We can get like very creative with the rendering. We use red clay, we use white clay. Just like we, we have, you know, we have like white clay. And bamboo Nobody questions the strength of them. You know, it's beautiful, it's strong, but the only concern people had was about durability. We've developed like system to treat them. So instead of like lasting three years, now it would last 40 years, 50 years. You know, in Nepal we have like amazing vernacular architecture. But what happened in last 30 years, 40 years, like with influx of concrete, we kind of lost all this and everybody started to move into these concrete blocks. I was very disillusioned by this, you know, I was
was like, uh, maybe we can do something. So if we show people that you can build beautiful homes using local materials, people will adopt it, no doubt. So this is a kind of seed that we are planting. We like we're building a house for this single mom who lost everything. the students from Kopila Valley School. There are about 25 students. Um, they're here to ram earth uh, to help Sanu Maya Tama, and uh, it's a volunteer program. Abari grew a lot more bigger after the earthquake. Uh, we're working on reconstruction projects. Actually, San Maya Tamang's house is our first uh, house after the earthquake, so this is one of the model houses. I like the family. I to go to the house. I to to the house. I to go to the house. I to to for me, sustainability means, one, where does it come from? What happens when it's destroyed? There's ecological part, there's a cultural part, like where is the money going? Like when I build with earth, more than like ecological, I'm, I feel better because there's so many people learning this skill. And we're building a vernacular language of architecture. पहिलो भन्दा धेरै यसले जानिसक्यो पहिला त केही थाहा थिएन बाँसको यस्तो यस्तो हुन्छ भनेर कसैले देखेको पनि थिएन कति ठाउँमा काम पनि गर्यो बाँसको यस्तो हुन्छ भनेर मान्छे पत्ती आएको पनि थिएन बाँसको यस्तो हुन्छ भनेर तर हामी काम गर्दै गयो गर्दै गयो जब लास्टमा फिनिसिङ हुँदै आयो त्यतिखेर सबजना भन्थ्यो बाँसको यस्तो पनि हुँदो रहेछ भनेर सबजना विश्वास पनि गर्यो हेरे पनि हेरे यस्तो यस्तो हुन्छ भनेर So we chose to work with Abari um, for a couple of reasons. One, their passion and enthusiasm. They're you know, keenly interested in this type of work and their kind of focus is on ecologically sustainable um, construction techniques and also their interest in creating a sustainable solution for the village that was resilient and also had some economically sustainable aspects to it. The social aspect is we not only look at profit, you know, we look at like whatever we're doing is good for the community, is good for like the country, good for the climate. I think that's why it makes us a social enterprise. Aside from building houses using native materials, Abari manufactures tables, chairs and other furniture made of bamboo for various establishments. It also continues its post-earthquake relief work. You can learn more about this and all other stories on today's program on our website www.assignment-asia.com. I'm Wang Mengmang, thanks for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media.